The Crown is now the accepted narrative because it looks so convincing, because it is well filmed, and you can't just chuck it over as tabloid rubbish. It gets into your head. And I think that fiction can actually sometimes help us to understand the truth, but it shouldn't pervert the facts, and that's what they do. And that I resent very much. Hello, I'm Hugo Vickers. I'm a royal historian. I've been studying the royal family for many years. I have watched 54 episodes of The Crown with great displeasure, and it is my job this afternoon to point out some of the mistakes in this particular series. I've been lucky to work to some extent with the royal family on various matters over the years, so I feel I'm in a position to be quite critical of this series, The Crown, which purports to get everything right, but in fact gets an awful lot of things wrong. So let's play the first clip. You, you would take my advice? I would. She is talking to her uncle, the Duke of Windsor, who abdicated in 1936 in order to marry an American divorcee. And this scene purports to show the Queen seeking advice from her uncle. And I can assure you that virtually anybody else she would take advice from, but never ever him, because after all, he'd let the side down very thoroughly. Relations were not good between the Queen, the Duke of Windsor, or any of the royal family with the Duke of Windsor. He was palpably quite incapable of giving her any advice whatsoever. But what the Crown likes to do is to select people who have really given up their duty for love or something like that, and to treat those people in some way as somehow special. And it was completely ridiculous. I can assure you that in real life, the Queen referred to her uncle, the Duke of Windsor, as my silly uncle. I think one of the things that I think the Crown did do rather well was to show that the Queen and Prince Philip were once young and there's a whole generation that only ever thought of them as being old. And Claire Foy is a very good actress and she got the Queen's sense of timing. If you watch Claire Foy as the Queen, you come away rather liking the Queen, feeling sympathetic towards her. I'm afraid you don't get that impression with Olivia Coleman or with Imelda Staunton. Olivia Coleman has a sort of cheeky smile and therefore always this sort of, sort of sulking with a downturned mouth. And I think if you didn't know the Queen, you'd rather dislike her. And as far as Imelda Staunton, she plays her as just dead boring. I don't know how she could have made her so boring, but she did. Let's watch another one. Oh, gosh, look, I've got that one. And that one, actually. Oh, Christ, I've got that one, too. Look. Prince Philip goes over to talk to a Kikuyu chief, and he spots that he is wearing a Victoria Cross, that's the purple medal, and he berates him for this. Well, when you look at Prince Philip's medals, you discover that he, in 1952, is wearing a 1953 coronation medal. Now, you might well say that doesn't really matter, but I think it does matter since they're talking about medals at the time. Let's play the next clip. It was arranging gentlemen's weekends here and there with actresses and ballerinas. So this involves Ulanova, who came over with the Bolshoi Ballet in 1956. People don't remember that now, but it was an incredibly important visit. It was absolutely fascinating, and people were terribly excited about this. And the Crown somehow introduces the idea that Prince Philip might have been having an affair with Ulanova. Well, first of all, he was never in London at the same time as Ulanova. She was accompanied by her husband on the trip anyway. And so it was completely and absolutely fabricated. And I've checked all the dates and there was never any possibility that Ulanova and Prince Philip could even have met. His behaviour throughout the whole thing is, is always extremely disagreeable. But what they really did to him, which was absolutely outrageous, was a later episode. Back in the office, they said, hey boys, obviously Prince Philip hated Prince Charles to send him to Gordonson. We must make his father hate him, his father being Prince Andrew of Greece. So they cook up a scene where Prince Philip attacks a boy and his half term is cancelled and he doesn't go to Darmstadt. And so his sister flies over and her plane hits a chimney in Ostend and she is killed with her husband, her two sons, and there's an unborn baby that's actually born in the accident and, and dies in the conflagration. At which point, Prince Philip goes over to the funeral in Darmstadt. She would never have taken that fight. It's true, isn't it, boy? Yes, his sister did fly over, and in the fog, her plane did hit a, ch a chimney and she was killed. His father then came to pick him up from school, and the two of them travelled disconsolately over to Darmstadt together. So to make him responsible for that accident, which, by the way, they show in gory detail, I think is really beneath contempt. Let's watch another one. It was bad enough with just the music and shouting. At all hours of the day and night, Yes, well, Margaret's always been high-spirited. Banging and hammering and drilling. And it's not just me that's suffering. 
I know it's driven the Gloucesters quite mad. Well, this is absolutely hilarious. Well, all I can tell you is it must have been extremely noisy because the Gloucesters, Prince Henry and his wife Alice, did not live at Kensington Palace. They lived about three miles away in St James's Palace in York House, which is on the Mall. So I don't know what on earth they're up to there. Let's see what they've got wrong here. I'm John Armstrong from The Guardian. Could we have an interview? Yes, of course. <laughs> Prince Philip's mother, Princess Alice, came to live at Buckingham Palace for the last two years of her life. There was no interview with Princess Alice in any newspapers, nor could there ever have been, nor indeed were there ever any interviews with Princess Alice in any newspapers in the course of her whole 84 years of life. Let's play the next clip, which comes right at the end of season three. And if what we do is loud, grand, confident enough, no one will notice. And all around us, it's fallen apart. What they've done is to resurrect our old friend, the Duke of Gloucester, the Queen's uncle, who had died, in fact, three years before in 1974. And they've dressed him in a morning coat with the garter collar, which is the chain over the top of it. Now, his son, Richard, the present Duke of Gloucester, he did indeed wear a morning coat at the Silver Jubilee service, and he did wear a collar, but his collar was the collar of the Royal Victorian Order. So it was really nice of them to dress up Prince Henry, Duke of Gloucester, when he'd been safely dead for three years. Let's watch another one. What are they doing? Christ. Prime Minister, how nice to see you. Apparently, the royal family seek to torture Mrs Thatcher on her visit to Balmoral. I can assure you that the Queen was always incredibly aware that guests were likely to be nervous when they came to stay in any of the houses, including Balmoral. And so people would always have a, a dossier in their room telling them exactly what they should be wearing at any particular time, what time they would come down, the name of the maid serving them, any information which would put them at their ease. You would be a very brave person to insult an incumbent Prime Minister in the presence of the Queen. She knew that it was her role to support the elected person, be it man or woman, and to give, particularly Mrs Thatcher, any possible support that she could. She admired Mrs Thatcher very much. Mrs Thatcher was always quite nervous when she was with the Queen, so she had a kind of agenda of things that she liked to talk about. In retirement, when Mrs Thatcher had lost power, she gave her the Order of Merit, she gave her the Order of the Garter. Mrs Thatcher was, of course, made a life peer as well. The Queen attended her 80th birthday, and she also attended her funeral. And the only other Prime Minister whose funeral she attended in the whole of her reign was that of Sir Winston Churchill resulting in the children of my brother, their illness, their imbecility. Don't use those words. Would make people question the integrity of the bloodline. Well, the problem with this scene, it is suggesting that somehow the two nieces of the Queen Mother, in their condition, which was that they really never grew up and they were unable really to speak, they were very sweet little girls, but they just didn't, didn't they never developed. Had, some sort of, had something to do with the royal family. The inherited taint came through the Clinton family. The um, wife of the Queen Mother's brother, Jock, that is how it came into the family. And the wife has absolutely no blood relationship whatsoever with the Queen Mother. So it's completely irrelevant to the royal family. And the Queen Mother had nothing to do with putting them into a state nursing home at all. The suggestion that this was somehow implying that um, the condition of these girls would reflect badly on the royal family because, in other words, that they too might be suffering from something similar is completely without any foundation whatsoever. What happened was that in the 1980s, the newspapers discovered that these girls were in a state home and they went down and, and sort of menaced one of them and she sort of shook her fist and they took a photograph and it was very unpleasant and very, very sad. And tried to use that, of course, to make the Queen Mother look uh, as if she was an uncaring aunt. And th even that is different from what was going on here. So this is another of the really disgraceful episodes. And if it were to become public knowledge that there had been an unprecedented rift between Sovereign and Prime Minister, would that really be so bad? This episode tries to suggest that the Queen wants people to know 
that she's not getting on well with Margaret Thatcher. The Queen would never do such a thing because it's her duty, as she understood it implicitly, to support the Prime Minister, and she would always keep her views private. But Michael Shea, who was then the Press Secretary, he actually briefed the Sunday Times and suggested that the Queen and Mrs Thatcher were not getting on well together. And the reason that he did that was because he didn't like, he personally, Michael Shea, did not like Margaret Thatcher or her politics. So he was using his position to cause trouble between the Queen and Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher was very upset about the whole thing, very politely and very quietly. The palace, and at a certain moment, found Michael Shea another lucrative job somewhere else, and he was removed. And this, in every sense, is the final clip. What they all agree on is that getting rid of me is an act of national self-harm, which is why I've come to you, ma'am that together we may act in the national self-interest. How might I help? By dissolving Parliament. The earlier scenes were more or less true, and then at the end, they completely pervert the facts and twist the whole thing round to make an utter nonsense of it. The Mrs Thatcher character suddenly says, I'm going to go to see the Queen and ask her to dissolve Parliament in order to save my skin. That did not happen. As I speak, I have not seen the remaining six episodes, but I have a feeling that they're going to be very schmaltzy indeed, so that at the end of it, it all appears to end happily ever after, and people will go away saying, wasn't the crown nice, when in fact the crown was very far from nice, because there's some extremely unpleasant depictions throughout the whole of these series. It's very, very shocking, and I'm delighted that it's coming to an end. The sooner, the better.